Father, that is our prayer to you this morning, that we would see your greatness and the splendor of your Son as we join together and look at your word. So God, penetrate our hearts. Give us a softness to receive what you have revealed clearly. Give us humility to embrace your instruction for your people because we want to see Christ's greatness put on display. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. You can open up your Bible to the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 3. We're going to be working through verses 18 through chapter 4, verse 1 this morning. If I were to give you a small piece of paper, just a scrap piece of paper with an X on it, that piece of paper might or might not make sense to you. Well, you could understand that it is an X or maybe it's a cross or some sort of symbol, but it might not be clear what the actual purpose of the X on that piece of paper is. However, if I handed you a larger piece of paper that had a hole in it and you came to realize that this small piece of paper fit perfectly within the frame of that larger piece of paper, creating a full picture only to reveal that it was a treasure mark where X marked the spot, that would bring a whole new relevance and importance to that paper. If it were indicating that there was a treasure for you, you might think about those things differently. It would be much more important, much more impactful. Well, this morning we're going to look at a section of Colossians that, listen, if, if all we had was this section in the book of Colossians, knowing that it was from God, it would be enough. And it would be worthy of obedience to and embracing of, and submission to. However, when we understand where this instruction that we're going to be looking at this morning fits within the whole of the book of what Paul has been teaching and instructing, we come to find that this section is far, far, far more rich than we could have imagined. By way of reminder, Paul has been setting forth the infinite worth of Jesus. That he is the image of the invisible God, that he is the creator of all things, that he is the sustainer of all things, that he is the head of the church. That all of God's salvation purposes originate from and through Jesus. He is the supreme and exclusive reconciler. And in his death, believers have died in their old self and way of living was crucified, and as Christ was raised up, the believer has been raised up with Christ, a new man, a new creation. We don't look to other things outside of Christ. We don't look to worldly strategies and opinions and practices to have fellowship with God. Christ is sufficient. He paved the way. He made it possible. Yet, in light of who Christ is and what he has done, we are now called to live in accordance to this new man that he has made us into. And so chapter 3, verse 1, if you remember, there is the call to seek the things that are above. And verse 2 of chapter 3, set your mind on things above. Don't go back to the old man way of living, but live in light of this new man that you are created and now have union with Christ. These instructions are independent commands that we're going to look at this morning on how to live for this world. These are calculated, specific instructions for the believer. These are calculated, specific instructions on how to live in light of your union with Christ. Paul has set forth Jesus, his greatness, his supremacy, and now in light of the fact that you have experienced Jesus and seen him for who he is and been unified with him, live in this way. Or live as the believer is commanded in chapter 2, verse 6, which is to walk in Christ. Christ. 
Obedience to the instruction that we are about to look at isn't about moral conformity. It isn't about societal correctness or cultural accommodation. Rather, this is God's instruction for his people to live in such a way that our salvation through Christ and our union with him is put on display in how we live our lives. And so considering this reality, let's look together, read together our passage for this morning. Colossians 3, we're going to start in verse 18 and work our way through chapter 4, verse 1. Starting in verse 18, Paul says, Wives, be subject to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. Slaves, in all things, obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily, as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of your inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. And then chapter 4, verse 1, Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. Paul instructs the Colossians regarding three groupings of relationships that the believer's union with Christ impacts. Paul instructs the Colossians regarding three groupings of relationships that the believer's union with Christ impacts. And Paul addresses three groups of relationships and gives specific instruction to each participant regarding how they are to conduct themselves in light of their union with Christ. He's going to give practical, personal instruction for how to navigate these roles in light of the fact that you are a new creation in Christ, in light of the fact that you have died and your life is hidden with Christ. These three groupings we're going to see this morning are the wife and husband relationship, the child-father relationship, and the slave and master relationship. Now, these aren't the only relationships, obviously, that the believer's union with Christ impacts, but as Paul has been addressing how the believer's new life in Christ, in union with Christ, impacts their fellowship with God's people, he is now going to shift his thoughts more specifically to the home life of the Colossians. You see, the believer's union with Christ does not only reach the public, visible relationships we enjoy, but it also reaches the private, personal interactions within our homes. And just as everything is to be done, as Paul stated in verse 17 of chapter 3, in the name of Christ Jesus, how each participant conducts him or herself in these roles is to be done in light of the relationship that you have with Jesus. Paul instructs the Colossians here regarding three groupings of relationships that the believer's union with Christ impacts. And the first grouping Paul addresses is found in verses 18 and 19. And it's the marriage relationship as he addresses wives and husbands. So number one, wives and husbands. This is the first grouping that Paul addresses. And I want you to notice something interesting. In each of these groupings, there is a pattern. Paul addresses the subordinate in the relationship first, and then he addresses the one in authority. He addresses wives, then husbands, children, then fathers, slaves, then masters. Also in each grouping is the recognition of the Lord. Look down for a moment at the end of verse 18. He says, as is fitting in the Lord. And then the end of verse 20, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. The end of verse 22, fearing the Lord the end of verse 23, as the Lord, as for the Lord, rather than for men. And it is clear that obedience to these commands is a matter of Christian duty before the Lord, before Christ. This isn't man's opinion. 
but the sovereign ruler of the universe's direction for what is right and good before him as we navigate these various relationships. So first of all, Paul addresses wives. Look at verse 18 again. He says, wives, be subject to your husbands. The command is to be subject to. And this word speaks to authority and submission. It was a word that was used frequently in military contexts to describe ranks of soldiers under the leadership of their commanders. And the command is for wives to, on their own accord, submit or subject themselves under their husbands. A wife is to submit to the leadership of her husband as the one possessing leadership authority in the relationship. And this is to be a personal choice of the wife to embrace this abiding authority that God has set in her life in their marriage relationship. This is an abiding attitude that she is called to have, a disposition that she is to embrace. And this submission is to be her ongoing pattern in relation to her husband. And to obey this command is to do so without resentment, without discontentment. It is with joy and faith to embrace the role that God has ordained for you. God has established from creation a hierarchical order, not relating to worth as man and women we know are both spiritually equal before God, both being made in the image of God. It has nothing to do with value or importance, but rather with regard to roles, there are differences. And this is good. This is God's intention to have these differences and these roles are to be maintained in the Christian order of things. And then there's a, a clear clearness to this reality in the statement at the end of verse 18. Look again at verse 18. Paul says, wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Wives are to be in subjection as is fitting or proper in the Lord. Our relationship, our union with Christ is what dictates and rules what our other relationships are to look like. Paul does not base the wife's call to subject herself on the diligence of the man to use that authority appropriately. A wife's obligation to this command is not based on her husband's competency in his leadership. Otherwise, no wife would ever have to subject herself because every husband falls short. Rather, this is Christ's intention for her role. It's the wife's call to submit, and it's based on what is right before Christ. When a husband makes this easy, the wife subjects herself because it's right before Christ. And when a husband misuses that authority, the wife subjects herself because it is right before Christ. The ongoing disposition of a wife is to be one where she is eager and looking at every opportunity to express her subjection to her husband. She should not be looking for any and every opportunity to remove herself from this role, but should be seeking every which way to embrace it. That kind of disposition is what is right before the Lord. Paul keeps this instruction brief. Do you notice that? He could have gone into all of the nuances of possibilities and hypotheticals, and I actually felt the tension of that. Wives, submit to your husbands. We're going to see a number of different commands. And, and even in my study of this text was conflicted at times. Oh, okay, how can I bring clarity to all the nuances of the what-if circumstances? Paul chose not to do that. Rather, he gives this instruction, and it's to be followed as it is fitting before the Lord. There needs to be a contentment in our heart to let God's word speak to our lives and not chafe against it, but to rather in eagerness step out, desiring to obey it fully. 
Now, the reality is these commands, this command can be very difficult at times depending on the nuances and circumstances of a relationship. How do you navigate things like abuse, like every area of the Christian life, we are united with Christ and we are called to the body of Christ. We have the benefit of each other and we can help one another in our obedience to what God has called us to and we can help one another navigate the various difficulties we find ourselves in. And so what I would encourage us this morning for this command and the rest as we work our way through this text is to cultivate a heart that is Thinking first and foremost, how can I run towards obedience to these commands? And then if you find yourself in a circumstance that is particularly difficult and hard to be obedient to these commands in, invite the church, invite one another, invite the elders into your life to help you navigate how to best obey this command in the situations that you find yourselves in. That is what we are called to do with one another in the church, and we are eager to step into each other's lives and help. Next, husbands, our turn. The first person addressed in this grouping is the Christian wife, and the next is the Christian husband. Look at verse 19. Paul says, husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. And we see two commands that are given to the husband. The first one is to love your wife. This command is also to be continual and habitual. It is to be the regular pattern of one's husbanding. If you remember in verse 14 of chapter 3, Paul calls all believers to love one another as the binding agent for all of the other virtues of Christian conduct. And it is because of God's amazing, impartial, unmerited love for the Christian that the Christian can love one another. Likewise, the Christian husband can, and with the love of God in mind, love his wife. With the foundation of God's love for him, a husband is to selflessly love his wife as the continual, ongoing, consistent pattern of his life. Well, what does this love look like? Love here is to be a decision of the will to intentionally and continually consider your wife's good above your own. You are to die to your own self-interest and esteem her in all things. You are to love your wife. You are to love your wife when she is with you. You are to love your wife when she is not with you. When you are in public together, you are to love your wife. When it is just the two of you together, you husbands are to love your wife. You are to perpetually conduct yourself, husbands, in a manner that has her best interest in mind. At every moment in your marriage, that is the call from the Lord for you, husband. Her subjection to you does not free you to lead her to accommodate your desires, but rather the wife's submission to her husband frees the husband to lead her in what is for her best interest. This is so crucial in God, godly leadership. To recognize that your wife's call to submit to you is not permission for you to get your way, to do what you want, to have things in accordance with your desires. Rather, a wife's call to submit to her husband frees that husband to lead his wife in a manner that she is esteemed, she is valued, she is considered in every decision. That is the call for the Christian husband. And this command for husbands to love their wife is completely independent of her conduct as your wife. We love husbands. Paul also says, and do not be embittered against them. To be embittered against is to have anger or resentment and bitterness of spirit. Husbands are forbidden to become bitter towards their wife. 
A husband is not to treat his wife with harshness or bitterness. There is not to be an embitterment towards her in their heart that would, that would lead towards harsh words or actions against her or a distant disposition against her. There is to be a yielding of preferences, an overlooking of faults, a forgiveness of wrongs, a contentment in unmet expectations, a gentleness of disposition, and a continual dying to self for the benefit of your wife. And a 12-hour shift at work does not get us off of this obligation. This is what we're called to, men. This is good. This is living in light of our union with Christ. You can do all things in the name of Jesus, including your conduct in your marriage, that Jesus would be magnified. In the household of God, in the church, wives don't submit to their husbands, and husbands don't love their wives simply because it looks good externally. We do this, church. We do this because it makes Christ look great as he is. It is a right reflection of a life living in union with Christ. We want to see Jesus glorified in our lives. We want the work that God has done, in fact, to be realized in our actions. And so we fix our eyes on Jesus and we humbly pursue what he has said is right and what he has said is good and what is best. And in so doing, it is good for us as well as we have the immense privilege of getting to live for the glory of our Savior. Think of how sweet a marriage where a wife is submitting to her husband joyfully and eagerly, and a husband is loving his wife selflessly and sacrificially and is never embittered towards her. Think of how sweet that would be as an experience, and think of how amazing that would be as a testimony in a wicked world to the greatness of Christ and how he transforms every aspect of our lives. From the most public display of our actions to the most private moments in our hearts, God, Christ, is to saturate our thinking and to rule within us. Well, Paul instructs the Colossians regarding three groupings of relationships that the believer's union with Christ impacts. The first grouping Paul addresses is the marriage relationship, and next we see that Paul addresses the child-father relationship, children and fathers is the next grouping, and we see this in verses 20 and 21. Paul starts with children in verse 20, so children, pay special attention. This is for you, but don't talk. That's not, this isn't the talking time. I'm just joking. You could interact a little bit. I'll tell you if it gets to be too much. <laughs> in verse 20, he begins with the subordinate in the relationship again. He says children. And this is a general term for offspring. And while Paul doesn't directly address the age, it seems that Paul is addressing children still under the protection and provision of their parents. And the command for children is to be obedient, to obey your parents. To obey is to follow and be subject to, again, like the other commands, this is to be an ongoing disposition of the life for the child. Do you see that in verse 20? Children, be obedient to your parents. Paul gives instruction to fathers in verse 21, but the command here for children extends to both mother and father as he says, obey your parents who will both be giving instruction to their children. And Paul broadens this command to the fullest extent. He says, children, be obedient to your parents in all things. The child's attitude is to be where they are eager and looking to obey their parents' every instruction. There are not big commands that you better make sure you follow and then little commands that we can kind of push and get away with. That's not the attitude at all. Rather, every instruction from your parents, every single one, is to be obeyed with eagerness and enthusiasm. Yes. 
There should be an eager embracing of the instruction given and an intentional pursuit of obedience to those commands. The attitude of a believing child should be one where they are quick in looking to obey their parents' instruction to the fullest. And Paul gives a reason. Look at the second half of verse 20. For this, that is obedience to parents in all things, is well-pleasing to the Lord. Children. Children, you are to obey your parents, not simply to please them, but to please Jesus. And just think about that for a moment. Sometimes as children, you can have the misconception that is the idea that's wrong, that what you do is not really that big of a deal. But God's word is telling us this morning that the one who created everything, the one who sustains everything, Everything actually is pleased when you obey your parents. This is awesome. This is amazing. And your obedience to your parents is significant. It matters. It feels good when you make your mom and dad happy by your obedience, by your behavior. But you have an opportunity to make the Lord of heaven and earth happy to please him and not only please him but make him well pleased and so children your motivation what drives you why you want to obey your parents why you want to obey your mom and dad should be driven out of a desire to please the lord children sometimes you don't feel like you want to obey your mom and dad. Those feelings can come and go, especially when things are hard or their instruction, you don't like it. You don't like what they're telling you to do. It can be difficult. But yet, if you love Christ, which I would encourage you to do, if you love Christ, there will be a steadiness in your heart which should pursue, which should uh, produce a desire to please him in everything. And so even if your parents' decisions don't make sense, even if their instruction doesn't make sense or it doesn't get you what you think you want, if you love Jesus, it doesn't have to make sense. You can just obey to please Jesus and trust him. Children, when your parents give you instruction, are you thinking, how can I obey this most fully? If they ask you to clean your room, how can I clean it the best that I can to obey and honor my parents? If they ask you to do your homework, how can I be as diligent in my homework? If they ask you to help around the house, how can I be as faithful in the completion of my chores? How can we honor God, children, in everything that you do in response to your parents' instruction? You seek to obey them as fully as possible because you want to please Jesus. Yes, I like that. I heard a yes. (laughs) Fathers. Next, Paul addresses fathers specifically, and Paul commands children to obey both parents, but now Paul turns his attention to fathers specifically, And he gives fathers the prohibition. Look in verse 21. Do not exasperate your children. To exasperate means to excite or irritate or embitter. It is to make resentful or to rouse to anger. Paul's addressing fathers in relation to this, which indicates that it was common for the typical father to exasperate his children. That may come as a shock to many of us dads, right? Oh, I would never do that. No, this is a pattern of the ungodly, unreconciled, natural man, and it needs to be addressed in the new man life of a believing dad. Now, in light of 
his union with Christ, that reality for the believing father impacts and reaches even how he parents his children. And in light of his union with Christ, he is to not exasperate his children. One of the primary ways that his union with Christ is to impact his fathering is that he does not provoke his children to anger or exasperate them any longer. Now, at this time was the Roman principle of patria potestas. I think that's how you say it. I don't know. Probably wrong. I'm usually wrong when I say words. But Meaning that fathers possessed unfettered authority and power over their children, over the parenting of their children. The father had the freedom to care for his children any way that he wished without recourse. That's scary. And though he possessed that authority legally under Roman authority, he does not possess that freedom to take his parenting into his own hands as part of the household of God under God's authority, under Christ's rule, where there were no boundaries under Roman authority for a father and his care of his children, there are boundaries under God's authority. Again, Paul addresses the heart of the issue and does not go into all of the various specifics and circumstances of what might exasperate children here. But a father, in consideration of this, is to give ongoing, careful consideration as to if his parenting, if his fathering, is creating an embitterment or resentful anger within his children. And listen, fathers, your, your wife can be a huge help for you in this. She can and should be such an aid for you in your consideration of your leadership of your home. Utilize her wisdom and insight in regards to your fathering. Now, to not embitter your children isn't to say that your children won't have outbursts of sinful anger. That happens with every child. We know that very well. But are you parenting dads? Are you leading in a way that is difficult for your children to be under your leadership? Do you have unreasonable expectations that they cannot achieve? Do you have too low of expectations? Do you have unjust rules? Are you parenting out of selfishness, wanting control to get what you want? Or are you ex exercising your authority over your children to train them in the Lord, to please the Lord? And fathers, as you consider your obedience to this prohibition, consider the reason for the command. Look at verse 21 again. Paul says, fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. Are your children faint-hearted trying to meet your expectations and requirements of them? And again, if you feel that you are struggling with this as a father, moms, dads, help each other think through this Evaluate how this is going, and if you're, if you're struggling, ask for help. What a privilege and joy to be a part of the body of Christ where we can come alongside and encourage and spur one another on in these things. There's a wealth of resources in this church of godly parents, and by God's grace, we don't have to navigate the privilege of parenting and stewarding souls for the glory of God independently. Ask any of the elders, ask your small group leader, Parenting is not for the faint of heart, and at the same time, it is such a tremendous privilege and joy to care for little souls. Or as it appears, post-COVID break, big souls. Kids are growing so quickly. So Paul instructs the Colossians regarding three groupings of relationships that the believer's union with Christ, uh, with Christ impacts. The first grouping Paul addresses is wives and husbands. The second is children and fathers. And the third that we're going to look at this morning, lastly, Paul addresses the slave-master relationship. Paul has been addressing household relationships and how one's new life in Christ impacts their home. Paul addressed wives and husbands, children and father, and now he's addressing another household relationship that was common in the Roman Empire at this time. It is the slave-master relationship. And it's important as we consider this instruction that we do not import our country's shameful practice of slavery into what the slave-master relationship was like in the Roman Empire. 
Also, it is important to understand that scripture is not condoning slavery as a practice, but rather giving specific instruction on how to honor God and live in light of one's union with Christ in the circumstances and relational institutions that they find themselves in. Slavery was a normal part of the ancient world, and while slaves were not even considered persons under the law in the ancient world, by the New Testament era, things were starting to change and improve. Individuals would even at times sell themselves into slavery as they frequently would be better off as a slave than a free man. They were assured of food and clothing and shelter, which was more than many who had their freedom possessed. And slaves could fill a number of roles, including doctors or musicians or teachers. They had opportunities at times for education. Slaves could actually purchase their own freedom, and yet many would not do so as they were happy in their role. However, this wasn't always the case, and this isn't to condone or advocate for slavery in any way. That's not the point of this, but rather to better understand the situation that Paul is addressing. An owner had legal authority over their slave or a master. And while at times it was exercised well, there were also certainly times where it was atrociously abused. And the slave-master relationship was an especially necessary issue to address for the church in Colossae, as we remember that Philemon was a believing master in Colossae, and Onesimus was an escaped slave who was also a thief, However, after his abandoning of his master, he became a believer and actually very dear to Paul. This is most likely why Paul spends a little extra time unpacking the slave-master relationship in light of one's union with Christ. Look at verse 22. Paul begins giving the instruction and he says, Slaves, in all things obey those who are your masters on earth. Paul uses the same word for obey that he did in regards to children and their parents. And again, it is a call for slaves to obey in all things. The slave is not to put contingencies upon his obedience to his master on earth. But Paul takes it further than just outwardly going through the motions of obedience. Look at what he goes on to say. He says, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. So the idea here is not just serve when the master is watching and present. Don't obey simply for visual appeasement of a task, but rather with sincerity of heart. That is with one motive rooted out of the heart. And the cause which motivates this sincerity of heart obedience that is to take place is the fear of the Lord. To fear an earthly master only motivates the appeasement of the outward, but to fear the Lord who sees everything, even the depths of the heart, was to drive the slave towards diligence in their obedience. The Christian slave was to live in an ongoing, ever-present awareness of the presence of the Lord. And God's instruction here, the word's instruction for us, is not a call for the slave to escape his circumstances, but rather to be faithful where he finds himself. This is the new life way, the being unified with Christ way to be a slave. Paul goes on to say, whatever you do, do Your work heartily as for the Lord rather than men, whatever the work assignments were, whatever the tasks that were given by their masters, they were to accept it. There was no task too low, but every task assigned was an opportunity not just to serve their earthly master, but was an opportunity to work unto the Lord. And any task, as we've discussed already, done for the Lord is a task that is far above anything that we in and of ourselves are worth or worthy of. The emphasis for the Christian slave and their work was not the external circumstances of their tasks, but their personal inward character before the Lord. Lord. 
Paul says, work heartily for the Lord. And then verse 24, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. The reason for this command to work for the Lord is because they know that from the Lord they will receive the reward of the inheritance. The slave was to look beyond the immediate compensation or earthly circumstances, even past this life, and was to look to the Lord Jesus. And from him is coming a particular and a unique reward, which consists of a particular inheritance. And this would have been shocking for a slave to hear this kind of news. And Paul says at the end of verse 24, it is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Again, Paul drives home the fact that while these slaves have earthly matters, earthly masters, they look through these earthly masters to their heavenly master. And he is the one, ultimately, that they are serving. Paul wraps up his instruction for slaves in verse 25. He says, for he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. Paul is given the positive reason for slaves to obey their masters. Here he gives the negative. Slaves are to obey their masters because those who do wrong will receive the consequences of their actions without partiality. God is an impartial God, and when slaves are disobedient, they will reap the consequences of their actions. In chapter 4, verse 1, Paul shifts his attention to masters. He's more succinct, but no less direct Look at verse 1. He says, Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. The master was to grant to their slaves justice and fairness. The master was to grant rightness, what was just before God, to their slave. This was the new man way of being a master. It was to do what was right to that slave, to be just, to be fair. And Paul says fairness, that that is things being held with proper balance. And Paul says, knowing that you too have a master in heaven, the master was to rule knowing he is someone else's slave also, and he will be accountable for how he conducts himself as a master, by his master. Both the slaves and the masters of this time were to acknowledge they were both slaves of a great, perfect master, and that was to profoundly impact their conduct and their relationship with one another. This is what being unified with Christ produces. It becomes not a matter of what you're doing, but for whom you are doing it. In all of these groupings of relationships, we realize that the most humble task for Christ is far greater than the most noble task among the world done for anything and anyone else. This is true in our embracing of God's roles and instruction for us in our relationships. And we do not have slave-master relationships, as Paul describes here. But there are absolutely areas of our lives where these principles must reach as we eagerly submit to the authority that God has put in our lives, recognizing that we are under a greater master. and We are called to do all things for that master. And so we look to Christ. We entrust ourselves to him. We lean not on our own wisdom, our own understanding, our own comprehension, or the pressures from outside of us to live in a certain way or to attain to certain roles or principles, but rather we humble humble ourselves before God's word, wanting him to speak to every part of our life, which he does. He has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. All scripture is God-breathed and useful for a various number of purposes that the man and woman of God could be adequately equipped, ready for every good deed. He has given us what we need to please him, and it is a tremendous privilege to get to give glory to God in our lives on this earth. And again, all of this is because of Christ. 
All of this is because of his sufficiency. All of this is because of his supremacy. All of this is because of what he has done in the gospel to rescue sinners, to reconcile sinners to himself, to free sinners from the burden and condemnation that we rightly had over us in our sins to give us newness of life and peace with God through the gospel. What a privilege to get to live this way. What a privilege to get to walk in Christ as we embrace God's good, loving, fatherly instruction for us. May we do it that he would be praised and glorified. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your kindness to us in Christ. Thank you once again for the tremendous privilege that it is to get to walk in him, be unified with him, to get to glorify him, that we are no longer slaves to sin, that we have been made new creations in Christ and that we are no longer bound to the sin that we once loved to walk in, but that your gospel work penetrates and saturates every part of our life as we are new and alive with Christ. Help us to be men and women, parents and children who love your word, who love your commands, who embrace them joyfully and eagerly, who recognize that our lives are not our own. We were bought with a price and we now have such a a joy to be your slaves, to have you as our master, to live for you. I pray that we would do that. We lift these things up to you. In Jesus' name, amen.